What a change of a day, right? Drove up in uh, drove up in the fog. It wasn't too bad. At least a couple hundred yards or so of clearing ahead, and an hour later, after uh, the service at Morgan's Point, come out to this beautiful sunshine. So, and I believe a hot day. If, uh, I have a. F Is she five years old now? Um, we joke about the fact that she's the weather lady. I guess at school, she's in junior kindergarten, they have one of those boards that kind of shows what's happening, and there's actually the weather forecast on it. So we just ask Elle at the, you know, when we see her, what's the forecast for the next couple of days? And she repeats it like she's a little girl on the TV, you know, doing the, doing the weather. Kind of cute. So, I've never been one, I think I've said this before, to read all the announcements. You have them in front of you, they're there, everything that's going on. I did comment on the fact that in all my years of going to church dinners, I've never been to a chicken and rib dinner. That's, that's going the extra step. I think that's kind of nice. Now, I guess Christ Church, they pointed it out where it was, but I guess I don't know the area well enough. In the village. In the village. Right in the village. Oh, right in the village of Wainfleet. I missed the Wainfleet reference. I wasn't sure in the village meant. Okay. I guess I passed it, wouldn't I? We would pass it on the way up here. Right the Yeah. It's to the right. Yes. And there's other needs for non-perishable food items and other such things. Um, I trust you take the bulletin home with you and give it some thought. There's always, there's always something good in it. And Liz always puts something on the back to make it interesting as well, to just give you something else to, to read. The, the, the joke this morning was that Stephanie um, still had up in the very top, she's gonna not like me for this, don't tell her I said this, but she was the first one to confess that she forgot to change the Mother's Day reference uh -huh. to this up here. And uh, so we had a little fun with that, but she did have a, a big Pentecost image on the front of her, uh, her bulletin. So she had the day right, she just missed that. And I just thought I'd share a couple things about Pentecost because it's really quite an important day, obviously, a very important day in the history of the church. Um, we can't lay claim to the title Pentecost at all because it existed as a previous Jewish long-standing celebration. And, but it was called Shabbat. And Shabbat was a, uh, a celebration of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then eventually over the years, it kind of morphed into as well a time of remembrance when God gave the law to Moses. So it had taken on two different meanings. Um, Pentecost, by the way, Penta, five, it falls on the 50th day of Easter. And of course it commemorates for us that day when the Holy Spirit ascended, descended, I guess we would say, on the apostles. And there was that rather momentous, amazing episode in the upper room uh, with a number of the disciples. And we read about it in the book of Acts, rather interesting, there's a rushing wind that comes into the room, there are tongues as of fire, we still don't know what that means. Uh, and there's the miraculous breaking down of language. Um, over the years, Pentecostalism has come in, to mean something different in terms of the tongues. But really at that time, the book of Acts is quite plain. That there were countless numbers of people coming into Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, the annual feast. And the people in this room began to speak languages that they didn't know because they were all basically Jewish. And they began to speak these other languages that other people could understand. And what they were saying was that Jesus Christ was died, rose again, ascended, and was indeed the Son of God, come to change the world and make a difference. In Acts chapter 2, we read, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And there's that reference, there suddenly came from heaven a sound like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And so we might say it's, a, it's an anniversary of sorts, it's a major celebration. Thus begins the Church of Jesus Christ, which we are part of these many hundreds of years later. And with that in mind, it's perhaps a good opportunity to begin our service as we normally do as Bonnie plays, meditating, giving some thought to important issues in our spiritual lives. And just to 
meditate on the fact that we are here today because of the faithfulness of God, but also the faithfulness of those believers who listen to what Jesus said, go into Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit is descending and given to you. And because they were obedient, we really have on that day the beginnings, the inauguration, you might say, of the Church of Jesus Christ, which we are part of, continuing that, continuing that work of representing Jesus Christ these many, these many years later. So as Bonnie plays, let's just take a moment to contemplate the wonder of this and also to get ourselves ready for the service before I lead us in a word of prayer. as we celebrate the goodness that we receive from your presence every day in our lives. And so we commit this time of worship to your love and grace in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It seems that the very first hymn that I chose this morning was a new one to Bonnie, but she's learned it as she can do so readily and loves it, says it's a good one. So we'll invite you to stand. Maybe it's new to you, maybe it's not. It's We Are One. We'll sing three verses of it together as we stand.
wonderful moment that you have here in this church of sharing, sharing a concern or sharing a blessing, something that you'd like the congregation to, uh, to share with you. Yes, sir. We had the privilege yesterday of celebrating our anniversary. 67 years ago, we were married. 67 years ago. Wow. That's beautiful, especially for you to add 67 years, we've been happy. Because <laughs> that's the wonderful, God bless. How good is that? Who else has been married for 67 years? <laughs> Who's been married for less than 67 years? <laughs> wonderful. Glad you shared that with us. Truly a, truly a wonderful blessing. I allow the uh, folks at Morgan's uh, Point to remain seated for this next hymn. Trust you're okay with that. I am. And uh, all creatures of our God and King. Three verses of this rather classic, beautiful, old hymn together. young people at Morgan's Point, I pulled these out again. Do you remember these? <laughs> My last time here at both churches was the Sunday just before the eclipse. And I remember sharing with the children, and perhaps with you folks as well, I don't quite recall how exuberant I got, but with the children I, I was explaining all the excitement of this eclipse happening, which happens so infrequently, and how excited I was to be able to watch it and be part of it, and then kind of sharing with them the importance that they wear these glasses, that you know you can't see anything when you put them on unless you're looking up at the sun. And so on the day of the eclipse, um, I got a couple chairs out of our garage that go on our back deck. We hadn't done that yet, I got them out, and I got a small table. I poured a couple glasses of nice red wine, my wife and I just sat there. 
and we didn't see a thing. <laughs> we had such cloud cover in Virgil, such heavy cloud cover, that I couldn't even see where the sun was, never mind the fact that it was about to disappear and come back again. We did have a bit of a, a darkening, but some people were heard were saying on TV, but that was exciting too, but that wasn't exciting at all. I was looking to see an actual amazing eclipse, and it never happened, and we just looked at them, and I just looked at each other, I was like, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> we're not likely to be around for the next one, so, uh, We'll just watch it on TV, I guess, and the news tonight, and see what it was. How was it down here? Were you able to in this area, or was it the same? We had breaks in the clouds, so we could see some of it. Yes. Yeah. We didn't have the slightest break in the cloud. Uh, my son texted me from uh, Ancaster that they had a full break in the cloud. I mean, if we'd known, we'd have gone up to right. visit with them. But anyways, the, the purpose of it was to talk about disappointment and how disappointed I was that this thing that we had looked forward to for such a long time. So I just shared with the children how we have disappointment in our life. Some of them are small. The fact that we didn't get to see an eclipse really is a small disappointment. Some of the disappointments will be bigger. But I shared with them about Paul, as I said, because they're, they're young, they don't know this yet. Paul, who was basically the, most, the major contributor to our New Testament in terms of the number of letters that he wrote. And Paul had things in his past that didn't please him. Disappointments. But he has this wonderful verse, I may have preached on it here, I know I've preached on it elsewhere, where Paul said when he thought of his life, when he thought of his life in the past, he said, looking back on those things which are behind me, I look forward now to what God has called me to do. So the lesson to the children was, even at their age, I'm sure they have disappointments, but just look behind and put them behind you. And think about all the good things that just lay ahead for you in your young lives, and even in our lives as well. And the many more wonderful years, we pray, that you two will have together and uh, be celebrating an anniversary again next year with us. So that was my thoughts on disappointment. And I don't even know why I kept these glasses, but I guess I kept them just for this object lesson for the children. And um, I think they got a little bit out of it. They just tend to stare at you, you know, when uh, you're never sure. But, but God bless them. It's nice to have them there. Um, well, we may as well do this. We, were, we sang Jesus Bids Us Shine. Now, I don't know when you sang that one last. I can't remember, other than I'm sure it was in Sunday school and in my church years ago. I can never remember having chosen for an adult service. But with the children in mind, we sang Jesus Bids Us Shine like a clear, pure light. So we we'll sing three verses together. And maybe you can stand this time. A little enthusiasm for this wonderful children's uh, hymn.
as we're about to bring our tithes and offering forward, just a reminder, I may have shared this verse with you once before, I find it a rather fascinating word from Paul. To the church in Corinthians, he said, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. I point out as well, interesting enough, when we read a passage like that, some who preach the prosperity gospel, mostly in the States, talk about, you know, you can't ever give God, you give money to God, God's going to give you more money back. And they make a ministry of that. But it's interesting to note that when God says here, those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully, he also goes on to say that those who do that will have an abundance, not of money in the bank necessarily at all, but you will have an abundance for every good deed. You will be blessed by God in your generosity to be able to be generous in doing good deeds to others. And that's the promise of God when it comes to dealing with our finances. We'll sing the doxology together as the offering is brought forward. we offer ourselves and our resources. May these gifts help us as your church uplift your name and praise and to be a witness to your many blessings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. may be seated. And now the reading of John chapter 15 verses 9. Assyrians, 
Persians, the nations of that time, a little later on, possibly even Romans. There's one thing we would have in common regardless of what nationality we might have called ourselves. And that common thing would be God. Or should I rightfully say, the gods. The gods would factor greatly in our lives. You see, because we would worship a multitude of gods. We'd, we would revere most of them with a sense of fear and caution. Because these gods would have no real interest in our well-being. They would, they would toy with us. They would demand fear. They might hold back the rain when we needed it most and they would, when they were angry with us and perhaps they would even demand the sacrifice of a firstborn child. And then God calls Abraham and Abraham listens. I find it interesting that we simply read that Abraham hears God's voice and he listens and he obeys. You know, there's no burning bush, as there is going to be a little bit later on for Moses. There's no Damascus Road experience that Paul would have a number of years later. God simply calls out to Abraham. Abraham hears and he listens. And God says to Abraham, go from your country, go from your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. The inference I think here is also go from the gods, the multitude of gods that your father's house and your society are worshipping. Because God continues and says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Note that, you will be a blessing. This has to be a radical idea for Abraham. God will bless and make him a blessing. Because this isn't the experience that he has with, in dealing with the many gods that his household has worshipped. And perhaps, just perhaps, Abraham responds to this call from God because there's been a longing in his heart to follow and worship a God who had his personal benefit in mind. I will bless you and make you a blessing. Speaking of Moses, Moses also meets God at that rather unusual experience of the burning bush in the desert. And he gets the word from God to be the one to bring freedom to Abraham's descendants. Here's how it reads in Exodus chapter 3. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, now this is Moses, when the Lord saw that this burning fire had so captured Moses' attention that he turned aside to see what was going on, God called to him out of the burning bush. Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet because the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, descendants all coming out of Abraham's lineage. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people, a caring God who, who are in Egypt. I've, I've heard their cry on account of the taskmasters. And indeed, I know their suffering. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land and to bring them to a good place, a spacious land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Moses, you see, also lives in a culture that is complete with a variety of Egyptian gods, each with the responsibility really to keep people in line with fear and with threats. And Moses, like Abraham, is meeting a God for the first time who speaks of rescue and blessing and bringing a people to a wonderful new place of existence, a new life. And so after negotiating with God, if you know the story, Moses has a number of reasons why he shouldn't be the one to do it. God has chosen the wrong person. But Moses isn't getting out of this responsibility. And Moses says to God, well, whom shall I say then is sending me? Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites, his own people now, never mind the Egyptians, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, and they ask, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, in essence, thus you will say to my people, I am has sent me to you. Just tell them that I am is sending you. No further explanation needed, just I am. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. I am the one and only one. I am the creator. I am the Lord your God, whom you will come to worship in time and to love. I am the one who will lead you into this brand new life. And I am the one your people will eventually write about, saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the God who re reveals himself to the Hebrews. Once again, a God of restoration and a God of blessing. Let's travel a little now towards our time, maybe another hundred, another thousand or so years, and we, we find Jesus, we come to Jesus. He's been living with his people, he's been teaching them about the kingdom of God, and he's been getting himself into trouble as he does it. Especially what he says to the religious leaders one day, before Abraham was, I am. A somewhat ridiculous statement, before someone was years ago, I am. But a statement that has significant import to, to the Jewish leaders because the term I am has now been taken to be the term to represent Jehovah God. And, and Jesus is equating himself with God. It's, it's total blasphemy. And so the Pharisees pick up rocks to stone him to death, but all we read is that he gets away. You know, for those of us who believe indeed that Jesus is also a living representation, if, that Jesus is the God, that Jesus is the great I am. For those of us who believe that, we have to listen and pay attention to his final instructions. And they were read this morning by Bonnie. Here is Jesus again with a totally different message from the gods that populated the world back then. Jesus says, as the Father, identifying the Father as a loving entity, as the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. So abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the line actually in this reading from John's Gospel that, that struck me. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Just think of that for a moment. With the crucifixion and significant pain and suffering lying in Jesus' future, he speaks of joy. He speaks of his joy, making it sound like a deep internal joy. And it's the joy that he wishes for his disciples and therefore for all of us. So we might wonder, who is this God that we serve? We serve a giving and a joyful God. The I Am, the great I Am, who has entered into our history by becoming one of us, and then the God who invites us to abide in His love as we also experience His joy. The God who told Abraham that He would bless him, and perhaps even more importantly, would make him a blessing to others. The God who called Moses to bring freedom from bondage to a people and lead them into a brand new beautiful experience. Jesus reminds us again that we are people called into light and to be fruitful. As the carol says, or the hymn says, Jesus bids us shine like a pure clean light. So Jesus calls us to be light, to be known as a joyful people to be more than just joyful people though, it's more than that. People with a mandate to bless others. Abraham was called to bless others. Moses was called to bless others. Jesus, of course, the great giver of all good, a great blessing to all mankind. Abraham was told that God would bless him, but as they say, make him a blessing as well. 
Moses was called to restore a whole nation of people who were lost and despondent without hope and restore them to a brand new beautiful life. So Jesus says that he wishes his joy to be resident in our lives so that we can be fruitful, so that we can do good things for others, so that we can be a blessing to others, so that we can be the people who are known for our love and for our compassion and joyful lifestyle, a lifestyle in service to Jesus Christ and to others, being a people who live in God's blessing in order that we may bless other people as well. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. A prayer hymn of sorts before I lead you in prayer. Bonnie comes to play a couple verses together, and you may remain seated as we sing this.
pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Standing and singing together this morning, our final hymn, Eternal, Unchanging, we sing. Thank you. 